So let's head back to our sampler and play around with our sounds a little bit now that we've got our basic drum data in. Let's close off this MIDI item and to get back into our sampler we just need to go to the track that we created and click on the effects and it brings us back to our familiar independence free window. Now remember we created a drum kit by clicking in here and loading up and that's done that as a layer and the way that independence works is that it's got multiple layers available and then within of those layers you can send different sounds to sections and we'll see about that in a second but this window here gives us and we can select what we're doing here to see different things but at the moment we've got the whole layer selected which means that any changes we make on this window will affect the entire layer and our layer contains our entire drum kit so it's all of the sounds now we play uh, as you can see we've got I've already played with the pick a little bit and we can now I can also play with the volume and the pan Now it should be said that things like volume and pan on an entire instrument basis are things that we're probably better off doing in our channel strip. Okay, The volume and pan are better used for uh, specific sounds in our kit and we'll get to how to edit them in a second. Now as well as that let's just go through a couple of the other things. We've got delay. And what delay does is delays the amount of time between the MIDI data being sent to the instrument and the sound coming out. So it's almost like an artificial latency. Um, there's, there's reasons for technical reasons why you'd want to do that, but we don't really want to use that at the moment. Over here is a slightly more involved section. and It's all about how many sounds can be triggered at once by the instrument. We've got limits per key here and the limit of keys per selection here now the limit per key as you can see is set to one here and what that does is means that when you trigger a note the sample that's assigned to that note will play if it's got one limit it will stop playing the first instance of itself in order to start playing the second instance of itself this is uh, the realistic interpretation of, say, for instance, a hi-hat again. If you hit a hi-hat and it starts to ring out, if you hit it again, even if it's open and it's still ringing out, what you've essentially done is stopped the first instance of the ringing out from happening so that the second one can ring out. And we can do that for each of our keys individually, or we can do it for our layer. But... An important thing to note is that this won't override the way that the sample is set up. Let's quickly look at how the samples can be set up over in the mapping section. As you can see, this open hi-hat is set as a one-shot sample, which means that when the data is triggered for that sound to come out of that key, it simply plays that sample. If we change that behavior to sample, okay, it's also called note on behavior by some samplers, you'll notice that holding the key down, we get the full sound, but if I press and let go of the key, then the sample stops. So let's go back to one shot again there. And this is all to be honest with you, a little bit more involved than you'll perhaps need for especially drum kit samples. But for instruments, it starts to make much more sense. And then we'll go back to modules again and look at the keys per selection. This is how many keys in total can be being triggered at one time. So if we play our track, you'll hear what happens when I drop the keys down. Okay. 
So what's basically happening there is that the entire sample is being stopped by another key elsewhere in the patch. This is not particularly useful for our entire kit, but it does allow us to set up some very interesting and quite important from a sonic perspective, extra actions that we want our drum kits and maybe other samples to do. So let's take a look at those. 